When you face a crisis in your life, what's the very first thing you do? What are the first resources you draw on? What are the first things you try to do in order to solve your problem? The Bible has a suggestion for you. It's a suggestion we find through a series of patterns that we find in Scripture. Whenever there's a crisis, heaven responds with worship. The Bible tells us your first response to crisis should be to worship Jesus. On today's program, we're going to be talking about crisis on earth and worship as a possible response. Welcome to Faith for Today. No membership test, no lines of birth or race or accomplishment, a church for people who have made errors. That's what this church is here for. You want a church? It's made for sinners, just a whole lot like you. This is the place. Just a few months ago, my Aunt Dorothy had a crisis in her life. She suffered a stroke, and she was very debilitated from this stroke. The left side of her body didn't work. She could hardly see. She couldn't speak very well. It was hard for her to communicate. And she began to wonder, whether her life was worth living. Well, I had gone up to see her for a little bit, and then a day or two later, after I had gone home, I called my mom to see how she was doing. Well, my mom had forgotten and left her cell phone in the room, even though she left. But a friend answered it, and when this friend, when Dorothy realized that it was me on the phone, she wanted to talk to me. And so the friend put the phone up to her ear, and we began to talk, and she expressed to me that she just wasn't sure if life was worth living like this. She didn't know if it was worth it. She couldn't do anything. Was there any purpose to her life? Well, I knew that she didn't have a real strong relationship with God, but I wanted to encourage her. And so I said, Dorothy, God loves you. He has not forgotten what's going on in your life. He loves you like his little child. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew she hadn't slept, so I said, I want you to just rest tonight and I want you to picture God's angels around your bed and just have peace and rest. Well, it was interesting what happened because she didn't speak in words. Instead, she spoke in a song hmm. and she began to sing, Lead me gently home, Father. Lead me gently home. Dorothy's intuitive response to the crisis in her life was to sing praises to her Lord and Savior. You know, that's exactly what we'd like to do right now. Let's join the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church as we sing praise to our Savior.
In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we learn something. We learn that the messages to the seven churches can represent seven different phases of spiritual growth for believers. And we found out that five of those seven are not real good. Smyrna was all right. It was a church that was persecuted, and God had nothing bad to say about them. And the other was Philadelphia. But you know, if we're honest with ourselves, if we're really honest with ourselves in North America, we would have to say that more likely than not, we fall into one of the other five categories. Our spiritual condition would be in one of the other five categories, and that's not good. I would imagine that most church members in North America would fall into one of those other five categories. Not Smyrna, we're not persecuted. And not Philadelphia, we have not arrived there yet. That's where we want to be. But we're in one of the other five categories. And if that's true, that the vast majority of the church in North America especially, if we can uh, include there the rest of, the, uh, of uh, the Western world, Europe, Australia, I think, industrialized nations, all of us fit into this category, I think, where we fall into one of those five basic categories. If that's true, that means that there's a crisis in Christianity today in the Western world. There's a crisis because our spiritual condition is not where it needs to be. Well, if that's true, and if there's a crisis in Christianity in the Western world today, what's the solution? How do we fix this? What's the answer? I believe that Revelation chapters 4 and 5 give us the answer. Throughout the book of Revelation, I find an interesting pattern that develops. You see, Revelation is filled with mysteries and beasts and all sorts of other frightening things that go about. And I mentioned as a boy growing up listening to this book preached, it scared me to death because people focused on those areas of crisis in the world, crisis going on. But yes, those things are there, but the pattern is this. In answer to every crisis, the next part of the book, the in-between parts, expresses heaven's response to crisis on earth. And heaven's response to a crisis on earth is always the same thing. They give glory to God. They worship the Father. They worship the Lamb of God. They go to church. The, Christ, the answer to crisis is worship. And that's where we are right now. We're looking at this section that's sandwiched in between a crisis that has either occurred on earth or is about to occur on earth, and we find heaven's response, and heaven's response is always glory to God, glory to the Lamb, because He is in control. You know, if you focus only on that part of the book, only on the crisis part, and some people who teach this book focus on only those parts of the book that deal with crisis, you've missed the major point of the book. This is a book about revealing Jesus Christ. And the revelation of Jesus Christ is that He is the answer to the crisis in your life today. He is the answer to the crisis in the world today. That's the theme, not the crisis itself. Don't look so much at the problem. Look at the solution, and that's Jesus Christ. You, look at, you focus on the other parts, you miss the message of the book. Jesus is adequate. He is sovereign. He is, he is supreme. Our answer to crisis has got to be Jesus. So open your Bible to Revelation chapter 4, starting with verse 1, as we look at the answer, not the crisis, the answer. And the answer is always Jesus. Look at it, verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. It says, this, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So immediately after showing John the spiritual conditions on planet earth and the fact that it's not a pretty picture, he said, now I want to show you something else. Let's look at the throne of God. Doors open in heaven, and in the Spirit, John is ushered in, and he sees the throne room, and it is beautiful, it is bright, it is glorious, it is colorful. He sees all of those things, gorgeous. And now he continues. Verse 4, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, 
And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne were seven lamps were, bla were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Now the best guess as to the answer, the, the meaning of the 24 elders that were sitting on these 24 thrones with 24 crowns on their heads is that these have to be representatives of the church in both Old Testament and New Testament times. You remember the Old Testament church could be represented by the 12 tribes of Israel, 12. The New Testament church could be best represented by the 12 apostles, 12. 12 plus 12, if my math is still good, is 24. And so this is basically a picture of God's people throughout all ages, those who have overcome, and they are wearing white robes. That means that they have overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ, and they are dressed in His righteousness. That's who these people are. Seven lamps are interesting. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. Passage tells us that these represent the seven spirits of God. We can assume that the seven lamps represent the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is perfect, is complete, it is adequate for your need, and is going out to the world. He sends His Spirit, and it is all that you need. That is the answer to your spiritual lethargy. It's the answer to your spiritual problems. The Holy Spirit comes in perfect ministry for your life today. It's only by this ministry that we can change our, the condition of the Christian church throughout the Western world. This description continues, verses 6 through 8. Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under the, his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We see a picture of these same living creatures in Ezekiel's book. The description is almost identical of these living creatures, and Ezekiel has identified them as angels. So we can assume that these are some, some form of exalted angel that exists in heaven. Got the six wings. Remember the wings represent the speed with which they carry out God's bidding? You remember reading in Isaiah 6, the worship service that took place there. The angels had six wings. With two, they covered their eyes. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they flew to do the bidding of God. That's the same picture here. These are exalted angels who sing continuously before the throne of God. They sing of His grace. They had many eyes. Eyes are symbolic of wisdom and discernment, of knowledge, of intelligence. And many eyes tells us that their intelligence, their discernment, their wisdom is very, very great. Their song is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, although Revelation is written in Greek, the truth is that the idea of this song is reminiscent of the Hebrew. And I've explained to you before that in Hebrew, if you wanted to say that something was really good, you didn't just give the name of it, you, you repeated that name. So if God is really holy, you say He's holy, holy. But when you take it to the third degree, God is holy, holy, holy. That's as holy as it gets. It's talking about setting God apart as being ethereal and other and separate from you. He is holy altogether. And that holiness is what makes, him, makes us reverence Him, fear Him, Adore Him, because He is different than we are. So repeating that tells us that God's holiness is something very, very special. He's also said to be the one who was and is and is to come. God's not just the God of yesterday, not just the God of the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And He's not just the God of the future. We'll see Him in heaven. He's the God of here and now today. He is in control of this very minute, this very hour. He's here every bit as much as He was in Old Testament times, every bit as much as He was in Jesus' day. He's here, He's here today, and He is the God of today. He is God in your life. Look at verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne, and they worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, 
to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. These four living creatures are engaged in extraordinary worship before the Father. The 24 elders show him complete devotion as they fall face down in his presence. These crowns were given to them because of, they were victorious on this earth. They overcame sin. They overcame Satan. But they are acknowledging that their victory came not by their own power, not by their own might, not by their own holiness, but only by the power, the might, and the holiness of God. Because they said, this crown is yours, Lord. I give it to you because you and you alone are worthy. You overcame. You did it through me, but you're the one who overcame, not me. I show that you are king in the universe. I give you my crown. During Roman times, if a king in one of the provinces of Rome was to come in for an audience with Caesar... He would come in and bow and he would take the crown off of his head and lay it at Caesar's feet and he would say, you are worthy. You, O Caesar, are worthy. During that time that John wrote Revelation, Domitian was the Roman emperor and his official title was our Lord and God. In this vision, John shows us that there is only one who is worthy and who is worthy of the title, our Lord and God, and that is the God who sits on the throne in heaven. Not Caesar, not any earthly potentate, but only the God of heaven is worthy. He alone is our Lord and God. 24 elders acknowledge this truth. They give their crowns to God in recognition of the fact that they could do absolutely nothing of their own strength, their own power, their own wisdom. And they sing praises to God that refer to Him by the title, Our Lord and God. The praise they give to God acknowledges that He is worthy to receive honor and power and glory. He is worthy, they say, because He is the creator and sustainer of all things. You know, the leaders of the Protestant Reformation based the Reformation on five basic doctrinal principles, only five principles. Uh, keyed and drove the, the Reformation. Those five key doctrinal statements are these. Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, and glory to God alone. Those are the five premises of the Reformation. And it is the last of those premises that this Scripture seems to be exalting and confirming. It is glory to God and to God alone. Whatever it is in your life that deserves glory, it is it belongs to God because He's the only one who is worthy. Glory to God alone. You have accomplishments in your life. For some of you, it's you've overcome great obstacles in order to find success. Others of you are proud of the wonderful family or marriage that you have. Others of you are proud of success you've had in career or business. The truth is, Revelation 4 tells us that whatever that accomplishment is, God is the only one who, who is worthy to receive glory and honor because it was Him working through you that produced that good thing in your life. All glory belongs to Him, not to you. On February 19, 2002, Vanetta Flowers made Olympic history by becoming the first person of African descent, American or otherwise, to win a medal at the Winter Olympics. Vanetta was, and her teammate Jim, Jill Bacon won gold in the bobsled for the United States of America. Vanetta became an instant celebrity. She was on the talk show. She went on the Today Show. And she was named as, by People Magazine as one of the 50 most beautiful people in the world. In spite of adoring fans who lauded her and praised her athletic ability and her physical beauty, Vanetta always responded to that by saying this, I thank God for this win because without him, I wouldn't be here. All the praise given to her. She said, you know, God's the one who gave me athletic ability. He's the one who helped me train. God is the one who deserves his glory. Every interview, she did that. Vanetta was singled out at the age of nine as a track athlete that had Olympic potential, her first track coach. In fact, she says, my first track coach, DeWitt Thomas, told me that I could be the next Jackie Joyner Kersey, and I believed him. But she says, but it was always the Summer Olympics I pictured. Vanetta had a full scholarship to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she became one of the school's most highly decorated student athletes. 
She was the first from her family to ever graduate college. But when she tried out for the U.S. Olympic track team, ankle injuries caused her to finish 13th, and she missed the team in 1996. Vanetta said, I'd, I'd achieved a lot of success in track and field based on my individual efforts, and I believed if I trained hard enough and stayed healthy, that would be enough for me to make the Olympic team. I didn't yet realize I needed God in my life to help me find my purpose and to understand that what he wanted for my life was far greater than anything I ever could have imagined. The following year, she started attending, attending church with a close friend, and it was there at church that she decided to receive Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and dedicate her life to him to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Vanetta married. She married a preacher's kid. Bless her heart. And she tried again for the Olympic team in 2000. But again, ankle injuries and now a back injury caused her to miss the team. Her husband saw a flyer advertising that they wanted track and field athletes to try out for the bobsled team. Well, she decided to try. After years of training, Vanetta ended up with Jill, on Jill Bacon's team at the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City where they won their gold medal. Vanetta says, I just put my faith in God and let him take over. I do my job of training and put the rest in his hands. I don't know if you are in crisis today or if you are celebrating some wonderful victory, but I know what your response to either should be. You are to give praise and glory to God. He and he alone is worthy. God is to be worshiped. God alone is to be praised. For further study or just to send in a prayer request, visit us online at faithfortoday.tv. If you appreciate our weekly broadcast and would like to help support this ministry, you can call us at 1-888-940-0062 or write to us at Faith for Today, Post Office Box 1000, Thousand Oaks, California, 91359. Or, of course, you can visit our website at faithfortoday.tv. We would love to send you a free copy of Pastor Mike Tucker's book, Your Heart's Desire. This easy to read book illustrates God's longing for a relationship with you and how that can fulfill your ultimate heart's desire. Please contact us now for your free copy of Your Heart's Desire by calling toll free at 1-888-940-0062 or log on to our website, www.faithfortoday.tv. The Ten Commandments are creating quite a bit of controversy lately. Should a judge have the right to bring a granite monument of the Ten Commandments to work? Is old-fashioned morality out of style? Pastor Mike Tucker has joined 10 other authors to answer these questions in The Ten Commandments Under Attack. We'd like to give you a free copy of this important book showing how each commandment helps form the foundation of our society and our daily lives. For your free copy, call 888-940-0062. If your heart longs to grow closer to the only one who can satisfy your cravings, then you'll love Pastor Mike Tucker's latest book, Heart Food. This new book has 32 easy-to-read devotionals from the Psalms designed to help satisfy your hunger for God. If you would like to receive this free book, call us at 1-888-940-0062 and ask for Heart Food. You can also write us at Faith for Today, P.O. Box 1000, Thousand Oaks, California, 91359. Or visit us on the web at faithfortoday.tv. Contact us now for your free copy of Heart Food. And may you find food for your hungry heart and grow in the grace of God. In 2 Chronicles 20, there's a story about King Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Israel. It seems that Jehoshaphat and Israel faced a real crisis mm -hmm. because several nations had come together against Israel and they were threatening to destroy the nation. Jehoshaphat knew that his army was not up to the task and so he turned to the Lord in prayer. He had a prayer season and he asked the prophet for his input as well. And after a prayer, the prophet spoke and he said to King Jehoshaphat, the Lord has spoken. He's told me exactly where you will find the army and he said not to worry because God will fight this battle for you. 
you will not have to fight. Well, King Jehoshaphat took him at his word. And the next morning when he gathered his forces together, he did not have his brave men of valor lead them into battle. Instead, he placed the choir at the head of the army. The choir led the army into battle, <laughs> singing praises to the glory and the love of God. They sang of his beauty. They sang of his majesty. And when they found the enemy army, during the night the enemy army had turned on themselves and had destroyed each other. Mm -hmm. And it was only left for Israel to plunder what was left there. They took away all the goods. They did not have to fight. Praise and worship had won the day in their hour of crisis. Do you have a crisis in your life right now? May I suggest that you try worship? As you turn to Jesus in worship and praise, He will fight your battle for you. He's promised to do it, and I know He will. He'll never disappoint. Thank you for watching today, and we'll see you again next week on Faith for Today. Lies all the world can offer All its power, its wealth and fame Down the other, just a man With nail scars in his hands but there is healing in his eyes, and there is power in his name. I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus without a solitary doubt. I choose Jesus, not for miracles, but for loving me. And not for Bethlehem, but for Calvary. Not for a day, but for eternity. I choose Jesus.